So I want to say, Governor, it's just really great having you at the conference. Uh, it, I was thinking about how fun it would be to sit down and interview you after Father's Day, because you're a great father. Uh, and uh, really, I was reading about what your wife is up to and thinking about what a great husband you are, but also just thinking about what a great governor you have been to my former state of Maine, well, home state of Maine. And for those people in the audience, I think it's important to really lay the groundwork of where Maine was when you took over as governor. Um, some people have heard me talk about 20 years ago being elected to the Maine legislature, and Maine was so blue. I think that even the Republicans kind of look like Smurfs because they were tinted blue. <laughs> and then, they still are. <laughs> well, um, so, so anyway, uh, so then we get uh, march forward towards 2010 when you're elected, and this is a state that had billion dollar shortfalls mm -hmm. with a three billion dollar budget, just massive fraud. Uh, the head of the Turnpike Authority went to prison. You had the head of the Housing Authority; she was using business cards to fund her own vacation. Uh, the welfare system had expanded so great that one in three people were on some kind of welfare program. So that's what Maine was, and then you're elected governor in 2010. And before we talk about what you've de done there since being elected in 2010, I want to go back even earlier. And what I want to do is talk about your own life story, which is really an amazing life story. And it's not just the story of you, I think it's really the story of America and what America and what Americans can accomplish in this country. And it's a story that everyone here needs to hear. And your story starts out that you're one of 18 children in a French-speaking family in Lewiston, Maine. And what I want to do, there was this great profile piece that was done on you back in July of 2014. And I want to just read from this article because it tells the beginning of your story, and then I want you to take it from where the article leaves off. So quoting from the article, Paula Page's first memory is of his house nearly burning down. Of his father, LePage's earliest recollection is the man kicking him on the ground. And of his siblings, he recalls tripping over the body of a brother who died one night in their Lewiston tenement. A tenement where at one point, 88 children lived in the 12-unit building. The article goes on, as, earlier as, as early as LePage can remember, his father beat him when he drank. LePage said he was actually, Monday through Friday, he was a great guy. He worked hard and he tried to provide the best he could on minimum wage. But when the week was over, Gerard LePage drank heavily, stopped only when he had to return to his job on Monday. And the abuse came to a head one Sunday night in 1959 when Paul LePage's father sat the 11-year-old boy in a kitchen chair and slapped him over and over until he knocked the boy from his seat. The governor says, then I fell on the floor and started kicking, and the neighbors heard it and came in and stopped it. LePage's nose and jaw were broken, and Ger Gerard LePage gave his son 50 cents and told him to go to the hospital and say, tell the staff that he fell down the stairs. The governor recalls, I said, nope, I'm out of here. Running away at 11 saved my life, because after that, the people I ran into we're all good people. So yeah. Governor, at 11 years old, you're homeless. Tell well, us what happened from there. Well, the first two years, first of all, I've uh, carried a 50 cent piece since 1959. <clears throat> Every single day of my life for no other reason than to remind me never to hit my kids or anybody else's kids. I mean, it's very, very important. That's the kind of culture that I was brought up in. From 11 to 13, I sort of lived on the roads and on the streets, and they called uh, couch surfing for friends. I've lived in cellars and cars. Uh, there's a, the Grand Trunk Railroad Station in Lewiston. It's now been turned into a uh, restaurant. So I went there with my staff not too long ago, and the bar is right where I used to sleep, because <laughs> it was an abandoned building. And uh, 
about the age of 13, I got a job. I, I, during this time, I had a paper out. But then I got a job in a grocery store and a dishwasher and a restaurant. And that family took me in for three days a week. And then I got a summer job working on a Pepsi Cola truck, which I, I think I was in the eighth grade. I gave a speech on my career path, which was wanted to be a, a, a Pepsi Cola truck driver. And believe me, I was like, dead serious. Didn't realize that it got any better than that in life. Uh, and so that's really when my life started to turn for the better. I'd say that the first day of my real life started the day I entered college. Um, I applied to 50 universities coming out of high school. And uh, I was my, well, I'll tell you the story in a second, but I applied for 50 colleges and I got rejected by 50 colleges, some of them the same week. Uh, so I made a call to one college, uh, University, Hudson University, and they let me in to, uh, I told them it wasn't that my, I was uh, not capable of doing the work. My math were in the 700s, but my, my English, my verbals, if you spell your name right on the exam, you get 200 points. I failed to get 300. <laughs> Think about that, I failed to get 300. So I convinced them that it was a language barrier and they gave me a French exam to see how I do and I got like a 740. So it wasn't a level of not being able to do the work because I just wasn't very good in English. And from then on, uh, the harder I work, the luckier I get and I've lived the American dream and uh, in 2014, and this is to all those of you that are in public life, in 2014, the night before the election, the national media, every net network media had me losing and I was going to be the worst defeat of any governor in the country, including Tom Corbett. Tom Corbett was going to get beat less than I would get beat. But on that day, we set a record for the most votes for a governor in the history of our state. And our state is a very heavy welfare state. So the point is to, to all public officials, be aggressive, be honest, be out there, and stick your neck out. Because if you don't, you'll be forgotten tomorrow. And when you don't have money, you have to be a little bit outlandish to get publicity. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we see people with even a lot of money are a little bit outlandish <laughs> to get publicity. Uh, how, has you, how has your life experience in watching other families shaped your own view of welfare and how government can keep people down? Well, as I just said a minute ago, Going in the eighth grade, my career aspiration was to become a truck driver because I thought the person I thought the most successful that I knew was my uh, foster dad. I call him my dad. He was he's sort of like a mentor to me my whole life. And I thought that was the epitome of success. And he'd say, no way, you gotta do better than this. And so what government does, it'll come in and it does everything for you. It makes you uh, dependent on society, on government. And in Maine, we're finding out that as we take people off welfare, as we encourage, we inspire, we give them their self-respect and their dignity back, and they believe and you show them by, through education that they can get skill sets, they can achieve, they can do more. I, I've known a young lady now that in 2011, a, a young mom with two children, no child support, uh, really struggling and was angry at me. I mean, was absolutely incensed and hated me that I was going to reform welfare. And then when she got her RN degree, she sent me a letter and she apologized. And not only she apologized, she wants to know, how can I help you? How can I get my word out that this is the way to go? And so you just got to forget the newspapers. And in Maine, what I say is that newspapers have become so bad in America that you can't even believe the obituaries. <laughs> <laughs> and buying a newspaper is paying somebody to lie to you. <laughs> so I am not, they don't like me and I don't like them. 
and uh, we have a and it's a great relationship. In fact, when I got elected in 2014, after the re-election, I got a call by the editor, the publisher of the Portland Press Herald, say, you know, the first four years are a little rough. Why don't you come in? I'd like you to meet my editorial board. Maybe we can develop some kind of relationship over the next four years. And my response was, Lisa, in all due respect, if I went and sat down with you now, I'd lose all credibility with main people. <laughs> because that's how bad they are. They're so biased. And I don't believe that they're deliberately biased. I just think that they're a built-in bias. So I think this is a great segue to uh, a cartoon I want to put up on the screen just to show sort of a little bit of how horrific the media has been to you. So this was ranked in one of the papers, actually my former hometown, the Bangor Daily News, is one of their top political cartoons, if we can throw it up on the screen, about you and welfare. Oh. <laughs> and this is mild compared to a bunch of other things. As you said, talking about your work in actually getting people out of poverty and like the woman you mentioned who now has the hope of a better life. Oh, incredible. In fact, she is now going to be a homeowner. She's all excited. She's now going to own her own home. So this is what it's about. And this is what you can eliminate welfare. But when the biggest mistake was made in July 1970, uh, 1964 when Lyndon Johnson signed a bill for a war on poverty. What he should have done is had a war on education to educate, force every town, every community, every state to strive for education, to fight a war on illiteracy. Those are the places we have to go. It's education. And so, by failing to do that, we've lived over 50 years in creating poverty. Creating poverty. Now, 1964, we had 14 million people. 40% uh, of the people were in poverty in, in, in 1964. 14% of Americans were in poverty. Today, it's almost 17%. So we've lost that war. So let's change it over. Let's use education to get people the skill sets necessary to see what's available to them in the future. Let them choose what they want to do, but inspire them to do it. That's why I think education has failed, because education teaches. Education should be mentoring. We, we need to mentor our children. I am the first generation after the great generation, the greatest generation. I'm very fortunate. I was able to live the American dream. I don't think kids in my stay today, the children that are going through what I went through back 60 years ago, or 50 some odd years ago, are gonna have the same opportunity I've had until we change our mentality and how we lead particularly government. Government is failing the population. So, as you were going through and pushing all these welfare reforms in Maine, did you ever doubt that what the media was saying or what Democrats were saying in reaction was different than how the voters felt? So, talk to us about sort of the disconnect between what you heard when you interacted with voters uh, or just the people of Maine compared to kind of what people were reading in the papers or... Right. Well, 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 first of all, I had all the confidence in the world becoming governor of attacking welfare. It was one of my first priorities because when I was a kid, my mom and dad were too proud to go get the, go to the surplus store. So they'd give us bags and we'd go up and we'd get the cheese and the powdered eggs and the powdered milk and the peanut butter and we took it home. We'd stand in line and get it. It was free. Well, that was very embarrassing. And I do agree that's very embarrassing. Now what they do is just give you an EBT card and you, you're fine. Bad mistake, bad mistake. Because you gotta feel a little bit of uncomfort, you know, discomfort in order to want to get out. It, I don't have a, it's not a, a bone in my body that doesn't believe that 95% of the people in welfare want to get out. I'm not saying all, nothing's perfect. But the overwhelming majority want a way out, want a path out, but they don't know what it is. They don't know how to do it. 
Some will go, you know, you, you, you make a decision, you got a Y in the road, you go right or you go left. I went right, I lived the American dream. Some go left and they end up in prison. Um, it's just what it is. So I believe from there, right from the very first moment, that I could make a difference in welfare. Because I knew how welfare people think and feel. The press, I ignored them because I'm telling you, they don't know what's going on. They, they live in a fiction world. They live in a world of fiction. We live in a world of reality. Every day we have to solve problems. Every day they just put ink on paper. And I should have listened to Abraham Lincoln writing that don't go into battle against somebody that buys ink by the barrel. But that was one of my biggest mistakes. <laughs> But the fact of the matter is, the people I speak to, the people on the street, I didn't get the most votes in the history of our state because I wasn't caring for the people on the street. And that's where the most politicians and the media don't get it. They're not communicating with Main Street. So welfare is just a piece of the legacy of now your six years in office. Um, and you certainly will have this legacy. And I think about how the left in Maine must just hate the legacy that you've built up over these six years. But welfare reform is just a piece of it. And you've talked about how it's an important piece of it. But tell us you know, three or four other big things that you've been able to get done because you took care of welfare. Well, I'll tell you. We, we took care of welfare and we were able to lower taxes. We lowered taxes from 8.5% to 7.15%. It should be 5.75%, but the left, you know, they come slowly. <laughs> Very slowly. And then we got rid of the uh, tax on veterans' pensions. We've increased the debt tax, I call it debt tax, the inherent estate tax, from I think it was a million to five million now we're at the federal level. I'm trying to eliminate it because I think the minute you eliminate it, a lot of Mainers come home and retire rather than go to Florida. I like Florida, it's a great place, and I have a house there. But two months a year is plenty. <laughs> six, six months in a day is too much. So I'd like them to come back for those four extra months. Uh, one of the proudest things that I've done, and it, we just got it done this year, is interest-free loans from anyone that wants to go to higher education. State will give them interest-free loans. And then we pass a second bill that if the employer pays off the loans, they get a dollar for dollar reduction on their taxes. So the student gets a free education by putting the time in. The employer gets someone he makes a contract with for five or six years of employment, they pay off the student loans, and now you train them into the culture of the company. If you keep them happy, you've got a good employee, student debt's been paid off, and the state is better off for it because we kept the person in Maine and not, a, and not let them go to Florida. So that's, I'm very, very proud of that. We put a 200 bed, uh, we're in the process of building a 200 bed treatment facility for people that have chronic uh, mental disease that have unstabilized in, in the, and they get off their meds. So we're trying to get a facility where we can get them on a treatment program so they can stay in their communities, stabilize on their medication, but more importantly to, uh, to attack the opiate drug problems this country's had. And we're losing in Maine five people a week to overdose, three babies a day in Maine. Now three babies a day are being born, afflicted to some form of opiate in their system and have to be detoxed. Uh, at that rate, we're gonna kill our society off. And so I need to make sure that we, we, we get to this pandemic and we should resolve that. And the, the, the thing that's gonna get us it's going to make Maine a prosperous state. If we can get uh, uh, natural gas to Maine from Marcellus Shale, then we can get our energy costs down. And really, the, uh, the two things that are holding Maine, Maine back from being what I would consider a top 10 prosperity state is its tax structure and its uh, um, energy. You clean those two up, then the people and the entrepreneurs will demand that government get out of the way. But the left doesn't like that because the left needs to have roadblocks because they need votes and they like to buy them. 
On the welfare reform front, I mean, you did everything from through your department with restoring work requirements to reducing eligibility, reducing the number of people not just on the time limits, not just in TANF, welfare cash assistance, but also food stamps and Medicaid all across the board. Your success measure is people off welfare and back to work. But there was also, I think, this fascinating conversation about how you would talk about welfare fraud and the response from the media would be, what fraud? You know, there's no fraud out there whatsoever. Uh, and what I want to do is just have a conversation with you a little bit about what you and your team uncovered when it comes to welfare fraud. And we'll be having a panel on this tomorrow, but I think some of these stories, it's really great to hear directly from you. So tell us about what you found with lottery winners. Oh my goodness. Staying on welfare. You know, we, we have lottery winners winning $500,000 and still collect unemployment. I mean, still collect welfare. I mean, the same day. Because there was no asset check. So they'd still continue to get their, their entitlements. And so we put in a, a little rule, it's not big, any asset over $5,000 that is uh, things such as lottery winnings and uh, uh, ATVs and uh, ski jets and boats and anything other than homes, furnishings, and car, uh, you, would be, you, know, you, you would not be eligible for, for welfare. Just simple little things. On the drug ones, it's just fascinating. Just fascinating. In the state of Maine, when I became governor, you could buy cigarettes, you could buy liquor, you could buy lottery tickets, you could go to strip joints, you could bail yourself out of jail, literally bail, get, you know, beat your wife up on Friday night, and bail commissioner comes in, you give him your ABT card and he bails you out. I mean, this is crazy. We were able to put some rules in. It took us a long time to get it done. In fact, we just got most of them just this last session, the final ones, the big ones, uh, like no more st strip clubs, and yeah, I, I don't get it, but. And bailing yourself out of jail, we just got those. But think about what happened. Millions and millions of dollars that was just being squandered is now being brought back in. And you know, we got more money than we know what to do with right now. And I'm seriously, when I say about welfare, because one, you have to do, make some big decisions, and there are some tough decisions. And I don't mean that there's enough money to take care of all the problems. I mean, there's money in the pot. There's no, we're not going to the legislature every three or four months say we need another 100 million, we need another 150 million, but we're out of control. We now are in a position where we can manage and manage priorities. Give you an example. We're never going to get away from having a safety net. Don't ever think that that's possible. That's not what we're trying to do here. What we're trying to do very simply, identify people with intellectual disabilities. Identify people that have severe disabilities, physical disabilities, that prevent them to be 100% effective or optimum level. We want to reach their medical maximum proficiency so that we can put them to work at a functional level that they can work at. And we want to take care of our elderly. We had a waiting list of 4,200 people that qualified for services, but we didn't have enough money because we were in red ink. We couldn't provide them. You know, one of the things that I think has been really so effective that your department has done too is really tracking where the money goes. Like you talked about shutting off the welfare cash assistance, the, you know, EBT cards in all of these locations. But I want you to also tell the people about what you found with the midnight ATM runs on the day that the welfare benefits hit everyone's card. Because this, it, I think, makes all sorts of great connections with what you were just talking about sure. with the drug baby and with everything else. Yeah, what we found out is we were having a lot of drug busts in the state of Maine. And every time there's a drug bust, there's all these EBT cards there. And I'm saying, gee, there's a black market for EBT cards. I seriously, I really thought that they were stealing EBT cards and they were marketing. But that's not what it turned out. It turns out the EBT cards were a form of payment. So Sam Edelson and, and Mary Mayer right here from the Department of Health and Human Services hired a, con a consultant and did a little bit of a program to identify where the money's being spent. 
So the first, the first report they give me is, Governor, I think it's the ninth of the month, the cards are loaded up and the money's made available at the 10th of midnight or something of that nature. There's a day where they're loaded, becomes available at midnight. Between midnight and 4 a.m., 50% of the money was gone. 50%. Now we do have a few grocery stores that are open 24 hours for baby formula and diapers, but I mean, half the money, our budget's 330 million a year, half the money every month was gone. So then they decided to go one step further. Let's see where all the, ABT, uh, the EBT money is being spent. 64 million out of the 330 million spent in other states. You want to know where the big state, the big cities, where the money goes? Hartford, Connecticut, Bronx, New York, Brooklyn, New York, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Disney World, Las Vegas. Now, Las Vegas, I get it. <laughs> Disney World, someday I'll be able to afford to go. I go to Fun Town up in Maine. But who in hell goes to the Bronx and Brooklyn with an EBT card, except the guy collecting payment? So we start tracking it. So we decide we're going to put a, pic a photograph on EBT cards. I think we put the EBT, we, put, we had the battle with the federal government. They said no. I said fine. I got up, I was walking to my office, I turned around and said, where do you want me to send all the work? Because I'm now going to proceed to lay off everybody that works on the EBT system. 500 people. Remember that day? They grabbed me, brought me back in, and, and they, said, they said, we have to negotiate and compromise. Well, when you said you can't do it, that's not compromising with me. <laughs> So they said, okay, well, let's talk it over, and we put the pictures on. We have not found one EBT card in a drug bus with a picture on it since October last year. Not a single one. Occasionally, you still get one of the old ones, but it works. This is, a, a, this is an underground system this country has developed by being too lenient with the money it gives to the people on welfare. Because there's no accountability. There's absolutely zero accountability once that money hits. And so we need, as states, to fight back with federal government. Right now, I just sent a, a not so politically correct letter to Secretary Vilsack about the SNAP program. Because we're suffering from obesity, we're suffering from type 2 diabetes, and we have suffering from hunger. And the hungry kids are the obese kids with, sec with the diabetes because they're not eating properly and they don't want to admit it. So we, the people that work in the states, the formulas of democracy that are going to save this country with its 19 trillion dollar debt, because if you don't have, if the foundation isn't there, it's going to crumble. And we 50 states are the foundation. So we have to stop the ability of drug dealers to get paid with EBT cards. We have to continue to continue to fight against Washington. Because Washington, and I'm a Republican, and I'm a proud Republican. But they keep telling me, we need a House to be able to make a difference. We give them the House. We need the Senate and the House to really impact federal gridlock and change it. Now they're saying, well, we need the House, we need the Senate, we need the presidency. Do we have to do everything for them? <laughs> So before we open it up uh, for Q&A, we have legislators and executive branch folks, staff here from 31 states. You've been on this welfare reform journey for years now. What advice would you have for policymakers who are looking to push even further or maybe take the first step in their own state? Ignore the opposition. Ignore newspapers. Get yourself on the streets and visit and talk to people that are poor. People that are on welfare. And I'm telling you, 95% of the people want out. 
They just don't know how. So what we did, and thanks to Mary and Sam, is one, we establish who belongs in the safety net. Those are the people with disabilities, uh, mental and physical disabilities, and our elderly. They need to be taken care of. Then we identify people 19 to 50 that are able-bodied, that can go to work. And guess what? What we found out. 62% of the people in Maine, between the ages of 19 and 50, that were on welfare, able-bodied on welfare, were men were men. So now we just ask them to go to work. And if they don't know how to work, we teach them. We have a facility in Maine. We built a new DHHS uh, intake facility in South Portland, Maine. And we have in there, we have education, well, uh, health and welfare, the veterans, and Department of Labor. You, you do an intake, you, you assess their skill levels, what they can and can't do. If they need skill sets, you send them to education and they work on them on getting them to either volunteer, work, or go to school. Those are the three options. If you want to be on welfare in Maine, you got to volunteer, you got to get a part-time job, or you got to go to school. Very simple. And then if you're a veteran, you go directly to the vet's office to the Veterans Administration, and we have a big program to get veterans to work. Uh, we have the program is called Welfare to Work, and nobody slips through the crack able-bodied. Now, those that have disabilities, and I'll give you a story here. It's fantastic. I, I still laugh about it every time I, I tell people. We had just hired a new attorney. Her name is Holly Lust. She'd been in the office for one week. I happen to go to the dentist, and I come out of the dentist at 7.30 in the morning, and there's this gentleman leaning on his car with a leg gone from above the knee. He's only got one leg. And he says, Governor, he says, I lost a leg in Iraq. And he says, I've been trying. Somehow I fell through the cracks, and I can't get a leg. They won't pay for a leg. If I had a leg, I could go to work. He says, what's your name and number? Go back to the office. Holly's been with us just about a week. And I said, Holly, I got a project for you. I need a leg. <laughs> <laughs> and she says, you need a what? So I give her the name and number. I said, call this gentleman up. He wants to go to work, but he needs a leg. Two weeks. A man had a leg. Now he's working. So that's what you have to do. You have to go out and do it yourself. And I have a bracelet. It's a domestic violence bracelet, but what it says is, if, it's, if it is to be, it's up to me. I got this when I was about 13 years old, working in the stables at the harness racing venue in Lewiston. I was living there and cleaning the stalls, and the, the gentleman there said, you know, nobody's going to do it for you. You've got to go do it yourself. So if it is to be, it's up to me. And that's the philosophy. So if the states that want to reform welfare, it's over, it's needed. It's way, way over. It's 50 years of one program that has failed us miserably. It is hurting. Uh, Maine has always been known for the work ethic. And we're losing that now. And so what I have done with this program and with Mary's help and the department's help, what we've all done is we've been able to take 12,000 people off welfare and into the workforce. We have a 3.5% unemployment rate, one of the lowest in the country. We need people. By the way, if any of you are tired of the heat down here and <laughs> want to live in a mild climate, we're, in, we were taking, we're all takers. We take everybody from all over the country. We need people because we have so many jobs, we can't fill them all. Now, do we have a lot of work to do? Absolutely. We're just tipping the top of, you know, it's the tip of the needle that we're going after. Uh, you got to go low-lying fruit. We, I think we were 44th or 45th in the country to finally put a five-year limitation on welfare benefits. Now what we do is we will work with anybody on welfare for five years. If we fail, I buy them a ticket to Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> All right.